Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be looking at Hobby 2000's HS129 in 1 to 48 scale. Definitely an interesting kit, so I hope you enjoy. So before I get into talking about the kit, I think it's interesting to talk about the kit's origins. So as you saw, it is a Hobby 2000 registered kit as per se, but the actual tooling is from Hasegawa. This was my first ever Hasegawa slash Hobby 2000 kit, but I was actually really quite surprised by the detail. This is by no means a modern or recent tooling, but the details are more than adequate. You know, there's a couple of dials, a couple of uh, little switches and stuff, all which can be hand painted and detail painted, which you will see in a second here. Um, but, you know, for, for a cockpit like this, which is so tight and concealed, you don't need any more. Referring back to what's happening on screen, I'm just going to give the interior of the fuselage and also the cockpit tub some of that German grey. I'm not going to try and pronounce it. I will just absolutely, I, I will not pronounce it correctly. Uh, but after this base coat of grey was put down, I then picked out one or two of these little uh, dials and knobs that I was talking about with a bit of white. Um, you know, I didn't spend too long here, especially as I knew that in the final um once everything is all cemented together you're not going to be able to see much of it at all but at least me and you know that it's there so this process was then carried out on the instrument panel but this time i used black to pick out a couple of the dials um or the the backs of the dials and then i'll come in and use a bit of white to pick out a couple of these other details like the the switches and all that sort of shebang I know you can see that I'm mostly just using white on video, however I usually like to use a white base and then come in on top with red for one or two of the switches just because if you're using a grey base for red sometimes it comes out more, um, more I don't know, more dull and less uh, punchy. I then moved on to spicing up the cockpit with a bit of chipping. I'm here using a sponge chipping technique. I use sponge chipping because it is much more efficient and in my opinion a much more authentic way of getting your chips compared to hand painting them. As you can see there I think that looks bang on. When it comes to metallic colour for this particular um, use I was using I believe it was Ammo Mig's uh, extreme, uh, not extreme metal colour but metal colour range. The control or instrument panel is then cemented into the cockpit tub and that is the cockpit tub assembly complete. This can then be put into one side of the fuselage. My only complaint with this part of the build would be that there are not any visible or, you know, well well put location tabs to know where to put the um, cockpit tub in. It was a bit more like trial and error, see what is happening. So dry fitting is definitely a necessity for this kit. But once everything is in the correct place, as you can see from the clip, it is a really nice fit. However, that does not mean that there won't be any seams. So these seams were then cleared up using VMS's Flexi CA. So if you've watched the channel before, you know that I do quite like to use super glue for my um, for filling in my seams. Uh, the joys of Flexi CA is pretty much that it's a more flexible glue, uh, super glue. So in the past, if you're using super glue, you might uh, have a couple of cracks after you've done all your sanding because super glue in itself is quite a brittle substance once it has dried. Flexi CA sorts this out by, I believe, infusing a bit of rubber into the CA glue so it can withstand a, a couple, a bit, a bit of torsion and whatnot. So with the seams seamlessly sorted out, see what I did there? Uh, it was then time to move on to the gear bays. These were once again it was pretty normal sort of average construction once again a couple of seams but these were all sanded out in a matter of minutes with gear base glued on i could move on to looking at the top surfaces of the wings this was not brilliant i don't know if the uh, one part of the wing was a little bit warped however the outer uh, edges of the wing definitely required some clamping to make sure that they were in the right place once they were in the right place of course it, it you know it didn't affect the build too much however it's something which you always get a bit worried about because warping can you know it can ruin a part 
but after battling with the warping we moved on. This time I took the two sub assemblies and smashed them together. Really nice fit here actually, uh, you know it's always a bit of a worry when you get round to putting those two sub assemblies together as usually a big seam arises, however this time it was not the case. So the vertical stabilizers, this was a slight issue that I had. They have this interlocking system which on paper does look like it could be really good, however they got the angles messed up. So that is what my uh, vertical stabilizers were looking like. So to sort this out I pretty much just got rid of one of the middle prongs on one of them and then wow look at that perfect so maybe that was a little bit of a letdown there a bit over engineered they would have been better just putting two pins in there instead but an easy fix i then went on to doing the sub assembly for the absolutely huge under uh, underbelly cannon i believe this is what gave it one of its nicknames the tank killer because you know the size of this gun is or cannon sorry is huge uh, but very nicely molded there by hobby 2000 slash hasagawa so now on to something a little bit fiddly. Uh, the ailerons for this plane did not be, they weren't molded onto the wing. So they actually had to have these, um, these I don't know, these joining points uh, cemented onto them. I, not cemented, I actually used super glue here because I was not convinced that cement was going to hold them there as, you know, they're, they're quite small and fiddly why this why they did it like this I, i'm not too sure if anyone knows please do tell me because it was very fiddly and also resulted in the aileron being pitched up so um yeah anyway another addition to the hobby 2000 boxing of this kit is the inclusion of vinyl masks which i think are they're nice they are it is a good touch because it means you don't have to go and spend any more money um on edward masks or any equivalents and they fit so and they keep that <laughs> they keep the paint out so i'm not complaining uh it's nice to note that the clear parts on this kit are actually really nice and clear uh, they don't stay this like this for very long but that's just because of me being me so i will get onto that when we get onto it Moving on to the engines, uh, all of these were initially given a, a dark grey coat, I can't remember the colour, I do apologise, and then they were dry brushed in a, an aluminium colour from, I believe it was actually AK. Uh, there's also poly caps in this kit, so that is for when you put the propellers in, that allows them to spin but not spin too freely, so actually really nice little uh, bit of thought there by Hobby2000 I imagine. I don't think these come with a Hasegawa kit. I might be wrong, who knows. So I did a little bit more painting of the engine before it was then cemented, or sorry, super glued into one side of the cowling. The other side of the cowling was then stuck together. It was very basic sort of engine cowling construction, nothing really to report here. Uh, but once that was all sorted, sanded and filled in, it was stuck onto the actual aircraft. With that cemented on, it was the general construction all completed this led me on to give the aircraft some i think i used two layers of vallejo's surface primer it isn't as um opaque as some other primers but i really do like the finish that it gives so on to the first bit of color for this build it is ammo mig's hella blau color um this is the only time that i'm going to be doing a bit of pre-shading on this um build purely because the upper surfaces are going to require many many layers and I thought when I was doing this that there was no point the pre-shade effect was just going to get completely drowned out by all these layers so I only did it on the underside and I do this just by using a slightly lower psi I think around 16 psi doing a bit of the old model effect in the panels and then this gives me a nice base to do a nice even layer of the actual Hella Blau color on top. This just provides a bit of tonal variation. I've said it a hundred times on the channel. I'm sure you guys know what it's all about, but it wasn't my neatest stuff, but I wasn't too worried about it. So just purely because I was going to do some weathering on it later. So when it comes to airbrushes for the entirety of this build, I'm using my Harder and Steenbeck Evolution and I believe I'm using a 0.4 uh, millimeter nozzle slash uh, needle combination, which as I will find out is a little bit too big. 
However, this was my finished underside. I was quite happy with how that came out. You can see on some of the panels, there's a bit of tonal variation and it looks relatively interesting. So as you maybe saw in the beginning of the video, I am doing a um, North African scheme of this uh, plane. So that means that there is an interesting squiggly pattern on top. However, underneath it is just your basic splinter camo. So to do this, I initially gave the entire model, uh, or entire, not the entire model, the entire upsurf upper surfaces of the model, uh, green slate color, I believe it's called by Ammo Mig. Um, this was applied at around 25 PSI. I have found that using higher PSIs for Ammo Mig's paints seems to work a bit better and give you a slightly smooth finish. However, feel free to play around with it. I know that they advertise about 30 PSI, but I found that that was a bit too much. So once the green slate color was all down, I then went on to mask off a couple of areas and do the dunkelgrün color. It, I didn't spend too long, you know, worrying about how accurate that this is compared to the uh, paint scheme that I got given purely because all of this will be drowned out by the squiggles, I know, very technical word, that will be on top. However, to make these splinters all sharp and everything, I'm using Tamiya's masking tape. I do like this stuff just because it's, it's quite easy to work with and doesn't, on the whole, rip up too much paint. <laughs> if you've been watching the channel, you know I've had a couple of issues with that lately. However, spraying this Dunkel Grun color, it is the exact same process with the PSI. It's around about 25 to 30 PSI. It just helps to get a nice smooth finish. If you're gonna be taking Tamiya tape on and off quite a lot of a model when you're masking, especially with acrylics, it is a tip to just pretty much put that tape on your hand a couple of times and rip it off just to get rid of a bit of the tackiness. And it just helps to ensure that you don't peel up any paint. Anyway, here was the splinter scheme. And before we ruin it, there is just um, one or these two uh, undersides of the cowlings which have to be sprayed in a yellow gelb color, I believe it's called. Gelb, gilb, something like that. You know, my pronunciations are not too good. Uh, but I actually really like this yellow. I prefer this to the normal luminescent yellows that I usually use on the, the tips of propellers. So I think I might use this one a bit more in the future. So onto the squiggles. I definitely had a bit of an issue with this at first, as you will see in the upcoming clip, uh, because of my me running such um, quite a big needle for this purpose. Like a 0.4 needle is not what you really should be using for this. I I, I ended up every so often spraying too much paint. Uh, you'll see in this clip here. See right there, way too much paint, and that's because I'm using quite a big needle, and I think I slipped a bit on the trigger. So what I did is I completely lowered my PSI. This is running at about 15 or 16 PSI. And I just gave my airbrush a complete deep clean before I even started this. This really helped get um, some squiggles. Probably not as tight and as neat as they should be. However, they were much closer to what I wanted them to personally look like. Also, when you look at a couple of reference images, it really the, the squiggles vary because these were all done on field in North Africa. Uh, with aerosol cans so they're all completely different thicknesses and different sizes different shapes so you can I don't really think you can have a wrong version of this camouflage but I definitely had to spend quite a lot of time uh, opting and like tuning my airbrush in to get the best results possible so after about 15 hand cramps this was my final result with the squiggles I was actually really happy with this and I think it looks pretty darn cool so with the squiggles put aside, it was time to go on to a couple more sub-assemblies. Here you can see me working on the landing gear and the wheels. These went together nicely. It was your bog standard sort of two pieces, slap them together and clear up the seam work. Um, the, the gear um, actual tip is not brilliant. It's too thick for the hole. So what I ended up doing was rolling up a piece of sandpaper, pretty much jamming it in there and then spinning it around a load of times. And on this side, I actually just completely cut it off because it just was not going in. So that is a little bit of a um, an issue with this part of the build. But, you know, once again, these are, these are small little things which can be sorted out with relative ease. You can also see that I've added um, a brake line on there out of just a scrap bit of wire. 
I didn't film this purely because I didn't know how it was going to look. I then went on to getting the exhaust um, exhaust pipes, I guess they are, into place. Um, you can see that I'm really struggling using my tweezers here, so in the end I just gave up and stuck it in there with my fingers. You should really um, put the exhaust pipes in before you put the cowling on, um, but purely because there's like there's a little tab which you have to stick it into however I didn't want to then brush paint these after I'd done all the squiggles so the way that I got around this was pretty much cutting off that tab and then sliding them in there and it looks just as good looking at the prop cone it had quite an abstract sort of paint scheme on it so I didn't really know how to achieve this but in the end I thought just using a bit of the sponge chipping technique but using it quite heavily was the best option and I think it came out quite close to a result that I was looking for. Not perfect but close enough for me. So a little something that I learned on this build was that German propellers are green. I, I was I was literally, I, I read this in the instructions and I saw that it was asking for this Dunkel Grin sort of colour and I was like, are you sure? And then I went and found a couple of reference images and sure enough, they were green. So there you go, you learn something new every day. There you could see as those props were going in, the joys of having poly caps. Anyway, there was the finished painting and construction of the model. It was now time to move on to putting a couple of the decals on. After my previous decal issues in my Phantom video, these were really nice. Before any of the decals actually went on, the entire model was given, I believe, two coats of VMS's HD gloss varnish. You have to put this stuff on quite heavily, so some people don't like it, but I really enjoy using it purely because it gives me a nice smooth and more importantly, a very durable finish. It means that even when I'm doing like all the harsh weathering or using micro set and sole, it doesn't alter with the underlying paintwork. So something that I really liked about these decals is the fact that they were in like for what usually would be um, one decal with other manufacturers. Uh, Hobby 2000 have them as individual pieces. This just reduces the need for as much carrier film and then reduces any chances of silvering. So I really liked using these even though it did take a little bit more time to get them all down. The decals in the end looked absolutely brilliant and I would say probably the best decals I've ever put down in my life. So with all of those decals down to make sure that they are all protected from what I'm about to do um, on top, it was given another coat of VMS's gloss varnish. Um, there you go, I actually showed it this time, so there's the stuff if you want to get it. Then I move on to first of all doing a um, pin wash or uh, you know just a general wash. As you can see, the gloss uh, varnish just allows the um, capillary action to work really, really well and it just kind of gets the oil and flings it around all of the panel lines and then it helps to distinguish all of the little details. Uh, I believe I'm using an AK wash here. Uh, I quite like this stuff. It's not brilliant purely because you kind of have to shake it every two minutes to make sure that it's all blended with the oil and other stuff, but it does the job and it is quite quite easy to work with. So once all of these oil washes have been put down, I leave them for about 20 minutes and then I will come back in with a clean brush. Uh, with it's, it's not completely like wet with white spirit, but it's dampened with white spirit. And then I will clean up all of the areas where it's kind of overspilled over and out of the panel lines. You can see me doing that in this clip here. Something that I have heard, which I do want to try in the future, is instead of using a gloss varnish, you should use a semi-gloss varnish, as this just helps to uh, for the oil wash to stick a little bit more um, into the panel lines. Because a gloss varnish is quite slippery, so it's quite easy to drag all of the oil out of the panel lines. So maybe I'll try that in the next build. So the last bit of weathering that I really wanted to do for this was the streaks and also the um, exhaust stains on this kit. When it came to streaking, I put a little, uh, some blobs of burnt umber oil paint. Then as you can see, I use a flathead um, 
paintbrush and then I'll just drag them in the direction of airflow. I then come back in with a dampened uh, brush with white spirit and then make them more into a narrow or skinnier shape or just a shape which I think looks correct for the area where the streak is. So I think that streaks should be on almost every model as they just add another level of realism and they're really quick and easy to do. So as I said, the final bit of stuff that I wanted to do was putting some quite <laughs> quite harsh exhaust stains onto the kit. This was done using Tamiya's little weathering pad and using their sponge. I'm sorry that my hand's in the way here, pretty bad filming from me. But I pretty much just drag it in the direction of airflow and then I will also use um, a couple of other tones which they have in the little in the little kind of kit to you know make it a bit a bit, a bit more realistic as in reality they aren't just this big black color there's some whites and also some browns in there I also like the applicator tool as it has a little brush which makes it really really easy to blend all of the colors in so with the model given a matte varnish and the masks removed that was this project complete really enjoyed this build as it was a bit of a challenge and it was another german camouflage which i really am starting to enjoy so i've got a couple of really big projects lined up for the channel over the summer so make sure to keep an eye out for them but without further ado enjoy the final videos and i'll see you soon bye bye guys